Ball Point Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here with us. If you are visiting with us, we welcome you. Hope you got one of our welcome packets. If you haven't, one of our deacons will make sure you get one of those. Give you some information about our church. Uh, I am saying I, I survived the Freedom Tour with 158th graders. So I'm back and in, uh, you know, got, got caught up on my sleep in two days. I'm not sure the girls, though, are caught up on their sleep. They've been sleeping an awful long time. But uh, if you didn't follow along on Facebook, we had a fantastic time traveling to New York City, Philadelphia, Gettysburg, uh, to Washington, D.C., uh, to Mount Vernon, and then back to New York City in seven days. So, didn't lose a person either. I was the best person. Didn't lose a soul. Almost lost an adult, but we didn't lose a child. So, but it was a lot of fun. So, and uh, I hope you guys all had a wonderful uh, service last week. As we, uh, if you guys had prayer, praise, and testimony Sunday, um, I do hate missing those, but it just happens to fall on the schedule when I'm not around. So, uh, I'll get the next one. I'm pretty sure. So we do have a few announcements and birthdays, and oh, look at that, he's skipping this morning. Mr. Gillum is skipping. Uh, Mr. Gillum is skipping this morning. So Greg Gillum's birthday is, was yesterday, and we need to catch him, so. Oh, did you say last week? Well, see, I don't have that marked down, so I don't say anything. All right, so. Uh, good, he was in his seat. Well, I wanted to get him good, too, so. I do have a card that was sent to us, given to us, and I just want to read it this morning. Uh, thoughtfulness like yours lifts my spirits, reminding me that God is with us every day through the people in our lives. To Small Point Baptist Church. The church and everyone in it has been a godsend to me. You all have helped me through some extremely difficult times. I don't know what I would have done without each and every one of you. Thank you for the blessing you are and all the happiness you bring. I love you all. Debbie Alexander. So, I want to read that. Uh, just a couple of uh, announcements this morning. Don't forget, next Sunday after church, if you did not do the child protection training, uh, last month we will have our makeup training uh, next Sunday. So if you did not work here for that, remember to stay after service. Shouldn't take us about 30 minutes. Um, so that'll be there. Uh, also, trustees, don't forget, next Sunday at 9.30, we are going to meet before service. So uh, write that down and don't forget. Uh, also, VBS stuff on the tables over here. Um, you see our rocket ship. We're going to space this year, so everything's starting to, to come together for that. Um, but there are some items we need, and so if you want to take the 4x6 card and bring it back, I think it's due back by the 16th. Is that, is there a reading? I, I, I think that's what you said last 16th, all right. So, so in two weeks, make sure you have those back here so we can get, get them out to the, the necessary people. Uh, also, we have our signs for Family Fun Day, as well as for Vacation Bible School. They can both go up because they're really close to each other this year. So Family Fun Day is Thursday, July 20th from 4 to 7. Um, if you are uh, interested in serving and helping that night, whether it's cooking or something like that, please let me know so I can get your name down so we can make sure everything is covered for the evening. Um, VBS will be July 31st through August 4th. Is anybody excited about VBS as I am? Oh my goodness, wow, there's some excitement, all right, big teacher, yeah, all right. We'll work on that excitement, okay, over the next coming weeks. Um, so I think those are all the announcements. I don't think I've missed anything. My wife's not here today because she's at home putting her foot up. So her foot is on fire this morning. Um, so just pray that that heals and she can get back up to standing and everything. Um, so with that, we're going to, oh, yes, Miss Nancy. Yes, yeah, on so the 22nd of July, we are going to have Nine to eleven. Nine to eleven. That's right. I have, it's on my calendar and just not on my list yet. So I will put that on there every week. So Saturday morning, July twenty second, nine to eleven, pancake breakfast. All right. You don't want to miss out on some good home cooking and some uh, senior bacon, right, Jeff? That's <laughs> to the side. Oh, to the side. Sorry, senior bacon. Not this way. It's this way. Okay, I gotcha. All right, I stand corrected. Okay, all right, well this morning let's turn our attention to worship, and our call to worship comes from Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, where it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So let us stand together and serve the Lord and sit song together by singing in 799, America the Beautiful.
school. Public school. We say this next one too. Then some soldiers came and asked, and what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the scraps of the sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the, his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. And the Lord had his blessing for the word. You may be seated. All right, kids, come on down.
What do you like, Rosie? You don't know what kind of fruit you like? Yeah, I like a lot. You like a lot of fruit. Okay. All right. What's your favorite fruit, Anar? Banana. Banana. Mmm, bananas are good. Isla, what's your favorite fruit? Blueberry. Ooh. Oh yeah. Here's the name. You gotta have blueberries. Well, there's all kinds of fruit. You guys ever seen a star fruit? Yeah. No. You've seen star fruit? An Elmo's? Ah, yeah, star fruit. How about a kiwi? Yes. Kiwi's good? Yeah, how about a mango? Mango's not my favorite. Uh, I don't think I'm not. How about a cantaloupe? Yes. Or a watermelon? You guys all like watermelon? Fourth of July is famous for which fruit you eat the most on Fourth of July? Watermelon. That's second. What's the most famous fruit on the Fourth of July? You don't know? Pineapple uh, in Hawaii, sure, in Hawaii. What do you guys think? It's red, kind of looks like a heart sometimes. Strawberry. Yeah, strawberry. Do you guys like strawberry shortcake? No. Yeah, no. I've never Seriously, it. really? Yes, I take that How about strawberry from our pie? Now we're talking my language, right? I, Which my wife made two of them yesterday. Yeah. So, but this time of year we, we eat fruit because fruit's good for us, right? But too much fruit can be bad for you. Do you guys realize that? If you eat too much fruit, yeah. fruit if you, why is that? You guys know why that is? You can turn into a blueberry. You can turn into a blueberry, that's right. That's right, you too many blueberries, you're, you're definitely turning into a blueberry. But sometimes a good thing is good if you have too much of it, because fruit has a lot of sugar content. So we eat the right amount of fruit, we get he good fruit. Um, candy is sugar. sugar, you're right. Candy is sugar, that's, a, that's the other one. Vegetables? Well, we're not talking. Well, veg oh, that's a good question. All right. Vegetables are good for us too. Do you guys know that vegetables are a fruit? Yes. Do you understand what I mean by that? There's a trickster called a zucchini. A trickster called a zucchini. Um, <laughs> zucchini um, fruit has the seeds on the inside. The strawberries are misfit. Yeah, that's right. Strawberries are misfit. Well, what vegetable is actually considered a fruit? Do you know which one it is? Zucchini. No, tomato. A tomato is a vegetable that is actually a fruit because it has seeds on the inside. Now, what I mean by this when I say fruit is that when you grow a pea plant or a strawberry plant or a uh, carrot, you grow carrots or zucchini or peppers, is the plant itself the fruit? I like no. peppers. You like peppers? Yeah, I like peppers too. The, the product is what we would call fruit, all right, as in the, it's what it produces. Okay, so you don't plant, you don't, guys don't plant lettuce and expect to get radishes, do you? We don't plant peas and expect to get green beans, or green beans and expect to get tomatoes. That would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Yeah. You don't plant an apple tree and expect to pick oranges, right? So everything produces after whatever it is. It produces a fruit for you to enjoy to eat. Do you guys know that in your life you produce fruits in every action or word you say? Do you guys understand? Do you guys realize that? You are producing fruit from what's in your heart. So when you get mad, what usually comes out of your mouth? Huh? Food comes out of your mouth when you get mad? <laughs> okay, all right. Huh? Thorns. Thorns come out of your mouth? Thorns, that's right, thorns. Bad word. When you're angry and upset somebody, you can sometimes say bad things, right? We've all been there. Or when you're upset, you cry, or somebody hurts your feelings, you can say something bad. So that all comes from our heart. In our heart, we are producing fruit from whatever we put into us. Like, is our soil good? Do we watch good things? Do we listen to good things? Do we, uh, are we around people that encourage us? Because all those things will impact us, and the fruit that we produce in our lives by what we say, by what we do, by how we love, are all... Fruit. And how we turn into a blueberry. And how you turn into a blueberry, that's right. Okay. So, I want to encourage you guys to think about. Yep, yeah, hold on one second. And, okay, can you hold one second? Okay, thank you. All right, when, when you guys, as you grow, you're going to, there's all kinds of things that you're going to want to look at or see or what's that. Remember, the more you look at something or follow something, you're influenced by it, and the fruit you produce will be impacted by all those things. So I want you to encourage, if you want to produce good fruit, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, and blueberries, yes, you got to produce blueberries. 
and blueberries. That you turn into. That's right, that you turn into, then you need to put things in you that will help you do that so that you can produce good fruit. Because if not, you might produce bad fruit. And Jesus says he's going to pick the bad fruit and throw it away. You don't eat bad fruit, do you? Does anybody here eat bad fruit? Yes. Yes, you do? I I'm sorry. I've eaten a rotten strawberry. You've eaten a rotten strawberry before? Really? Yeah. Do you know when my banana's gotten black, I usually cut the bad part out of it so I can eat the good part? Right? We, we, we cut the rotten stuff out. Well, let's try and have all three good stuff out so we don't have to cut any rotten stuff out. But when we do have some rotten stuff, we can cut it out and replace it with good stuff, right? So we can yeah. produce good fruit. Like not turning into a blueberry. Not turning into a blueberry. You're fascinated with that. So, Emmy, what did you want to tell me? Um, I tried pepper and I like it now. You tried a pepper and you like it? See, you, all you got to do is try it. You like all these wonderful things God made. And they are good for us. Especially when you cook them with onions and put them on a sausage. You like it. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to pray. You guys are going to be dismissed at Children's Church. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each one of these kids this morning. We pray right now that you would be with them and help them to understand by their actions, by their words, uh, Lord, the fruit that they produce could be good or bad. And Lord, that they would just remember to try and produce good fruit by looking to you and being influenced by you and your word and people at church and surrounding themselves with, the, with things that will help them to be an encouragement to one another. And Lord, for all of us to say, Lord, that we understand the fruit of our life is a product of all those things that we put into us. Lord, I pray right now that you just be with these kids and help them to grow and produce good fruit to your honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys are just going to go downstairs to Children's Church. I wish I could. I won't turn into a blueberry ever. <laughs> <laughs> So as we uh, take our time this morning to do our prayer time, let's yeah. start with uh, praises and prayers, anything that we can be thankful for God for this morning, or any prayer requests that we can bring before God. Yes. Our friend Nina, that we've been praying for for a couple of years, has been in the now in clinical treatment. So she just has to go for periodic scans for the cancer. That is amazing. Praise God. Anybody else? Yes. I got to praise God because while on the Freedom Tour, I got to have three gospel conversations with parents. That is so. Awesome. God puts us in places that we don't understand sometimes. That is amazing. Praise God. Anybody else this morning? Okay. Um, prayer request I'm going to bring up for you guys. Um, I'm having surgery. On Wednesday this week, it's nothing major. Um, I have a deviated septum, a big hole. They're gonna fix that, but as they're doing that, they're still gonna biopsy um, the max that I have in the back of my throat. They're still not sure what it is. Um, so just pray that when that comes back, everything will be good. Um, so just pray for that this week. All right, let's take the, yes. Pray for Rachel's foot. She yes. has these clogged sweat glands that are causing her incredible pain right now. And she can't walk or stand on it. So that's why she's not here today. But just pray that they get cleared up in the next week. Absolutely. So. Is there anything they need? Not really. She's, she's, got a, she's got some cream to put on it. She's got to stay off of them. Yeah. Um, well, so tell, tell a woman who's so busy that she's <laughs> yeah. off of her feet. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> that's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Just traveling mercies for Grace. She's yes. only Yes, Gracie is on her way home. Well, she's not yet, but she'll be leaving New York at about 6 o'clock tonight to arrive back in Maine by 11. Um, she went all the way to California and back, so just child mercies for her. Yes. Okay. So much appreciated. Absolutely. Yes, Nancy. These guys having surgery on Friday to have four kidney stones removed. Wow, okay. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's going to be keeping her in prayer. That's a, it's not a fun surgery. Yes, Evie. Yes. Okay. 
for sure we'll be praying for wisdom for them and um, peace for you as they, as they go through that. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. What an opportunity to serve in the church to help our fellow people to get places they need to be. All right. Let's take these before the Lord this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us, Lord, even with the rain this morning, Lord. We come into the, the house of God, Lord, to worship and praise your holy name, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, that we do still have this freedom, Lord, to come and worship you, Lord, to hear the message that you've given Pastor Ari this morning, Lord, and just to be able to not fare for our lives, Lord, as we worship you daily, Lord. We just thank you for this wonderful privilege and honor that it is, Lord, that we can do this. Lord, we just bring some praises before you this morning, Lord. We're just so thankful, Lord, for, for Nina as she is um, outside of all the treatments now, and she just has to go back for periodic scans, Lord. What a blessing it is, Lord, the, how much you've done for work there, Lord. I just thank you that all of this has been for your honor and glory, Lord. I just pray, Lord, as we have prayed for so long for her, Lord, and just seeing the fruit of prayer, Lord, is such an amazing thing, Lord. We pray that as she continues with these scans, Lord, and she continues... Um, to get stronger, Lord, that you'll just be with her, Lord, and encourage her as she continues on this journey, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for areas you got to go on this freedom tour, Lord, and the opportunity he got to um, plant some seeds, Lord, and share the gospel with some of the parents that were on the trip, Lord. I just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, of the times that you put us in these places, Lord, that we don't know when you're going to open the door, Lord, for us to be able to share the gospel. I pray that these seas, Lord, will be watered, Lord, and I just pray that there'll be a continuation of um, contact there, Lord, that they may just be able to truly find what they, they need, Lord, and that is you this morning, Lord. I just pray, Lord, as um, Rachel's home with her foot, Lord, I just pray that you'll give her peace, give her strength, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that um, you'll give her patience, Lord, if she's not able to be up on her feet, Lord. I know that's very difficult, so I just pray that you'll give her the patience, Lord, to rely on others around her, Lord, to be able to help her in this time, Lord. I pray for quick healing, that she may be able to feel um, better, Lord, to take this pain away, Lord. I can only imagine the, the pain she's in, Lord. I pray that she'll just take care of that as well. I do pray, Lord, uh, for Grace that she's traveling home today, Lord. It's been a long two weeks with her gone, Lord, and you've uh, taken care of her all the way to California and back, Lord. We're so grateful for it, Lord. We pray she continues this last bit of her journey, comes home tonight, Lord, that she'll just continue to give child mercies, um, and that we may just be able to pick her up tonight, Lord, and just everything will go smoothly, Lord. We do continue praying for Rosie, Lord, as she's still going through all of this with cancer, Lord, and um, she still has just this heart for you, Lord. We just thank you for it, Lord. I pray that that may be an encouragement to others as they see her in a time where it can be so difficult, Lord, still praising you, Lord, and still being encouraged, Lord. I pray that the church will continue to be an encouragement to her, Lord, as we pray for her, Lord, and just pray that you'll work in this way, Lord, that she may know, Lord, that there are many of us around, Lord, praying for her and just really waiting to see you work in miraculous ways, Lord. Pray for Jean Scott. She has a surgery this Friday, Lord, with these kidney stones, Lord, and some of them are very large. I pray for the surgeon's hands, Lord, that you'll learn to prepare them, Lord, that this surgery may go well. I pray for quick recovery for her, Lord, and again, I pray for the opportunity for the church to come around her, Lord, um, to serve her in a time of need, Lord, whether it be prayer or phone calls, uh, cards mailed to her, whatever it may be, Lord, I pray that we'll just take this opportunity to serve her in this time, Lord. We pray for Edie as well, Lord, as a time to be able to serve her in all of this, Lord, as she goes on the 6th to find out what's going on with her heart, Lord, and with this blockage. Lord, you can do so many miraculous things, Lord, and we pray right now that before she even has this appointment, Lord, that you'll already start to work, Lord, that the doctors will know what to do and that they may be able to help her, that this may not be anything that she has to think about or deal with any longer, Lord, but your hands of healing will already touch her, Lord. And again, I pray, Lord, that we can come alongside of her and help her with um, getting places that she needs to be and being able to travel if she's not able to drive, Lord. I just pray that she'll already set up an opportunity, Lord, that we can serve each other in this church, Lord, for there's nothing greater than to be a strong body serving Christ, Lord. I pray that uh, 
As Harry brings forth this message this morning, Lord, I just pray that you'll fill his mouth with your words. Let our hearts and our ears be open to hear what you have to say to us this morning, Lord. I pray all these things in your holy and blessed name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 3. This is where we're going to begin. It'll be our kind of our main text today. Today is Communion Sunday, um, and you know I always enjoy communion around the 4th of July because when we really think about what we celebrate on the 4th of July, we celebrate our independence as a nation to freely worship the Lord. And uh, today, uh, as we celebrate communion, and communion is the representation of the fact that we've been freed from sin so that we can worship God in a right standing. And that is, and that is always a joy and a reminder to me. Um, I did, I, I did get, you know, on the Freedom Tour, got to see some really cool places that kind of made me a little somber. Uh, the two places that impacted me the most was the 9-11 Museum and Memorial. Uh, that was very fascinating and very cool to go up, but just the reminders, the pictures, and the conversations I got to have with some eighth graders that knew nothing about it as they asked me about where I was, what was going on, and how I felt, and got to really share and open them up about the things that they don't realize are so important to them. And the other one was when uh, me and Mika walked through the Holocaust Museum. And once again, it was how could the world be so full of evil and wickedness and wretchedness that someone, some, like a whole nation would be willing to do this type of thing. That's what, my, what we were talking about. And to think about just the, 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 the deceitfulness and the ugliness of sin. And how far evil can go when we allow it to rule and reign. The fruit that it produces in the lives of those who are controlled by it. And thus, when we think about uh, communion, we think about church, we think about our relationship with Christ, we think about the gospel, the centrality of it and what it is. It's, it really is, when we understand the, the depth of the wickedness of sin and the depravity of humankind, it helps us appreciate the grace of God that has appeared, appeared to us in the form of Christ that, that helps us understand the love that he has for us who are so wicked and deceitful that he's willing to sacrifice his own son to save us from his own wrath and make us his children. That understand the power of the gospel that transforms us. Uh, to think about how it changes us from dark to light, brings us from death to life. All of this, you know, as we, we think through the idea of what the gospel is, you know, the last time we are talking about this, this idea of the gospel, it's not just the good news, it's more than good news. Because it's supposed to, to produce in you fruit. Alright? Fruit that lasts. Fruit that is, is glorified to God. Fruit that honors that which we've been given. And as I explain to these kids about what they have, that, they're, that these freedoms they have is because people have died in their place. It made me think that nothing in this world is free. Yes, salvation is free to us, but it costs Jesus his life. It costs something. But far too often, even as Christians, we take that for granted. We just go through life meandering, not thinking about the responsibility that we have to offer that freedom or produce or show what that freedom looks like to a world out there that is searching for something that's better than what they have. And so, as we are walk through this idea of the gospel in our lives, how do, how do we present it? I, I, this, this message this morning is one for the, that, that really, we need to truly understand that the gospel doesn't just save us and we're free from sin, and that it transforms us to be the gospel for others. If we're truly Christians, if we're truly followers of Christ, the gospel will take root, and that root will grow, and it will transform our lives. And so, just to, just to think about the fruit of gospel transformation today. In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist, as he comes on the scene, he really kind of dives us in. And he, in verse 3, he says, He went into the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then later on, you look down uh, in verse uh, 7, John said to the crowds coming, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. We have Abraham, and don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God raised, could raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
And then the question is, what should we do then? So here's the reality. We have to ask ourselves, what fruit are we producing? Think about it. You know, the, you know, always this time of year, we plant gardens. How many out there plant gardens? Have a garden. Or know someone who has a garden. All right? You plant a garden. All right? You seek to help nourish it. You, you, you seek to let it grow so that you can get the lovely nutrition that comes from those lovely peas. Tell you what, those fresh peas off the, off the pot, right off the, off the vine, those are the best peas in the world. All right, if, you, if you're not a pea lover, get fresh ones because it'll change your mind forever. All right, green beans. You know, think about all the fruit in the, that comes from, produced from the garden that we love and enjoy. Fresh salad like lettuce and zucchini and, and squash and, you know, carrots, which take longer, but they're all, I mean, it's just so amazing. I and mean, it's so yummy compared to some of the stuff you get in the store that's got our around. But the idea is, we look forward to that fruit because of the labor that we put into it. We plant it, we weed it, we water it, we fence it in so that no deer will take off with it because, you know, I mean, they love to eat those green bean plants. All right? You know, we, we do all of this stuff, all this hard work, so that at the end of the season, when it's ripe, we can pick it. Now, I'll never forget the first year we, we had this huge garden in, in Limerick. We decided to plant corn. I was looking forward to my first ever homegrown corn. I mean, the stalks were getting big, and the corn was getting ready to be ripe, and we we're like, all right, let's go get some corn. The next day we went out, and we were going to go pick it all, and the raccoons had gotten into the corn and ate all the big ones and left us all the itty-bitty ones. <laughs> they knew. They're like, suck it up, see you later. All right, they took all the good fruit. I was like, I was like, no, I worked so hard. I wanted corn. At least they didn't eat my potatoes. All right? But the reality is, we all look forward to that because we work hard at it. And it tastes so good. That's, the, that's fruit that is produced. See, the fruit is the result, the end product, that we get to enjoy and live out or live on each and every day. You see, the same can be said about our spiritual lives. We produce fruit each and every day. Sometimes it's really good fruit, and sometimes it's really bad fruit. Probably a little rotten at times. I don't know about you, if you're just like me, there are days when you get up and you start rotten, right? And it's hard to get it all straightened out and, and get it. But the reality is we need Christ to help us to produce fruit that, uh, it, that is godly, that is good, so that others can be impacted. You see, we produce fruit in our attitudes. Our attitudes. That's part of our, that's the fruit we have. I and mean, do we have a good attitude every day? Do we have a good attitude when something bad happens? Do we have a good attitude when, when we have to, you know, take the money we're saving for a vacation and pull it aside and say, all right, I'll fix the car? Do we have a good attitude with that? How about our emotions? All right, our emotions are, are part of the fruit of our life. I'm really mad right now, but I, know I shouldn't be because if I do, someone says to me, I'm going to blow up at them. Do we allow our emotions to control us? Do, do we produce good, healthy emotions? Even when we feel like just letting and blowing up, blowing off steam is what they call it nowadays, just blowing off some steam, do it on a golf ball. Way better than on, the, on a person, okay? Take the golf ball out there and blow off some steam by whacking it around, okay? That's why I go golfing. Blow off some steam, okay? How about our thoughts? This is one area where we, we tend to have a, we skip over this idea of like, if I keep it to myself, if I, if I just think about it myself, I'm going to be okay because I'm not thinking about anybody else, right? But in reality, what did Jesus say in the, in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, when you say you hate your brother, he says, when you think it, you've already done it. Done it. So we have to think about the fruit of our thoughts, and are they good thoughts? My, my wife always flips to Philippians 4, 8, think on things that are true and noble and just and of good report. This, this, we gotta, we got to produce good thinking, uh, or you know, our, uh, what follows next is our actions. We produce fruits by our actions. We all know what that is. You got good actions, you got bad actions. So what we feed on, what we water with, what type of soil we have in our heart will impact the type of fruit we produce in our life. Do we have good soil? Do we have hard soil? Do we have rocky soil? To receive the, the things, the nutrients that we need. I mean, have you ever tried to plant a garden in rocks? Doesn't work very well, does it? We, we want to find, we, we, we go through the ground, we dig out all the rocks. I remember when, when Rachel wanted to expand our garden in Limerick. I said, really? She said, I like to go like 12 feet this way and the whole length, which is like 20 feet. I'm like, 
Okay, so you get the tiller out and you till up all the grass, and before long you're getting these humongous rocks in the ground. You gotta go through and pick up all the rocks and pull them out, you know, so you have good soil. And then what do you bring into the soil to make it even better? You get a dump truck of manure. Mmm, yummy stuff. You gotta smell the holy yard. But it, it what? It, it produces good nutrients in the fruit, so your, your labor uh, is great. And I'll tell you what, those green beans that, that, that year produced and produced and produced and produced. Even after we plucked them at the end of the season, guess what? When they're sitting on the ground ready, waiting for me to clean them up, they were still producing green beans. That's how good they were. All right? So when we think about the fruit of gospel transformation, we have to think about when it comes to the gospel, do you understand that the gospel is the fruit of God's love poured into our lives to give life the ability to produce good fruit? Because without him, we cannot produce good fruit in and of ourselves. Its, it's fruit is born in us and from us so that it, it can impact others as we take in and we grow in the, the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel seed, once it's planted, will bear fruit in our minds, in our hearts, and this, pro, this produce, this fruit that will be that will be that we will produce will be pleasing and honoring to the Lord. So as we've been talking about the grace of God appearing from Titus chapter two, this gospel message, this gospel that has impacted us, that brings us here week after week, because if you don't have the gospel in you, coming each week is no effect. See, we don't invite people to come to church, we invite people to come to Christ, and Christ makes them part of the church. Because the church isn't this place, the church is the people. And gospel transformation is that very thing. As people come to know Christ, as people come to receive Christ, to repent from their sins, they become automatically a part of the, of the church as a child of God. And we are here to help one another to grow and to produce fruit that is honoring to Him. To hold each other accountable. You see, the fruit of gospel transformation will change us forever. It doesn't mean you won't struggle. It doesn't mean you will gain, you will gain, have all kinds of gains and no losses because you're going to go up and down. It's like the old saying, three steps forward, one step back. It happens. So here in Luke chapter 3, I want us to talk about three types of fruit that a Christian, a believer, should produce in their life. These should be the evidence of gospel transformation. And the very first one is what John says here, the fruit of repentance which is the idea of turn. Okay, the fruit of repentance is turning. The root, word, the root meaning of repentance is to have a change of mind or a change of purpose. It is a sincere and thorough changing of the mind and disposition in regard to sin. It involves a change of view, a change of feeling, and a change of purpose. Thus we can say it contains three elements, the intellectual, the emotional, and the voluntary. The fruit of repentance is this idea that I am wrong and God is right. I have not met the standard that God has set. And I need to repent. I need to ask Him to forgive me. And that's exactly what John preached. He preached a baptism of repentance for the what? Forgiveness of sins. Now, has anybody in here ever told a lie? I raise my hand first because I am a big time liar. All right? Okay? Uh, you know, I try not to lie, but sometimes it just, just happens. And if you didn't raise, if, you, if in your heart didn't raise your hand, then you just lied. So anyway, okay? We're all liars in here, okay? We all told lies. And, and have you ever wanted something that someone else has had? Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, I mean, when someone else has had a pie I didn't have, I wanted that pie. <laughs> all right? Have we ever thought bad about somebody? Particularly that person that zipped by us and cut us off in the line in our car. No, I never thought bad about anybody, ever, okay? I love them, and I say, good job. <laughs> when I'm really thinking, oh, I hope the good cop gets you down the road, all right? I mean, to think about what repentance is, it's the idea of not thinking my way, but changing my life to where I think, I want to say, I want to tell the truth all the time, I want to be honest. I don't want to, I don't want to lust after what other people have, I want to be content with what God has given me and use it for His glory. There's not a state of legalism that says, do this, don't do that. It's a state of my heart that says, okay, God, here I am, all of me, broken mess, take and use me. I'm sorry, Lord, that I have failed to measure up. And Romans 3.23 says what? For all of sin, fall short of the glory of God. No matter how hard I try, I will always fall short of that. It's like when I was growing up and I heard all the stories about how great my dad was at football. 
As a freshman in high school, he was a starting linebacker, starting running back on this huge team, and did all these accolades. And, and I was, I'm not my dad. No matter how try, hard I tried to be like him, I always fell short because we're not built the same. We didn't have the same thing in the same lights. So I really didn't even like football that much, playing it too much. I'll just take it. I don't like pain. And in football, you get hit too much. So I just didn't like the game. I played one year, and that was it for me. After I broke my wrist and tore my Achilles tendon on the very first play of the game, I was done. I said, no more football for me. But I always felt like I never measured up to him because I didn't act like him or be like him like he was. It's the same way we've got. We can never, in our own power and ability, measure up. So we have to understand we have broken God's rules, his laws, and recognize that I am lost and I'm heading to destruction. I'm heading away from that which is love and life and liberty. So this idea of repentance is a turning from going my way and going God's way. It's like, I'm going to go, I'm walking this way, and I realize this isn't the way I need to go because it's going to lead me to somewhere I don't want to be. So you turn 180 degrees and you go the other way. It's a humbling of our ways. Much, unmuch like most of us men when we're lost on the road. We never stop in directions, do we? Until, until you know, someone says, you need to stop. <clears throat> My wife does it to me an awful lot. I'm never lost. So if you want a full understanding of what John is preaching, let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul gives us this very uh, idea of what uh, true repentance looks like. What, what godly sorrow is. And in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 8, Paul is talking about this letter he wrote to them to, to point out their sin and not to not to judge them, but to point out and help them see that what they were doing was wrong. And in verse 8, he says, Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. And look what he says about repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, the fruit that it's produced. Look what it's producing. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourself to be innocent in the matter. Do you understand that when we repent, it's this idea that I don't want to be wrong anymore. I want to be in your eyes, God. I want to be right. So I'm going to get every ounce of my being, every fluid thing that I have to, to live in a manner that shows that I was wrong, that I'm sorry for the way that I lived. And we try and teach our children what it means to, to, to kind of re reconcile a relationship or reconcile a wrong. It's not saying I'm sorry. Okay, when you say I'm sorry, that's about who? It's about me. I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry that, oh yeah, I messed up. I'm sorry that, that you have, you feel that way. But who's that about? Is it about the person who's offended? No, it's about me and who I am. Godly sorrow says, I have hurt you. I have broken you. What can I do to make it right? How do I make this thing right? How do I, how do I reconcile a relationship to show you that I am truly, passionately, uh, uh, intended to make things right and, and to ask you to forgive me for the action that I have committed. That's repentance. And that's the fruit that John is saying needs to be produced in our life. That we understand that in every action that we live is all for me. And we understand that leads to destruction. We're looking for hope and God rescues us and we repent. We're saying, I was wrong, God. I want to do everything in my life to prove that you are what I need, that your ways are right. What indignation, you know, that the sorrow produces in us this desire to live in a way that is to glorify and honor him who forgave us. You know, Jesus tells a parable of the guy who owned the, the king 10,000 talents. That's like a, one, like $100 million. I don't know about you, but if I was someone $100 million, I would be begging and pleading for mercy too. I don't have a hundred. Does anybody have a hundred million dollars in here? Mm. Anybody? Mm. All right. No, no, we don't have a hundred million dollars. But if we're in debt, and the king says, "All right, you got to pay up," we'd be down on our hands and knees, saying, "Please, just give me a little more time. Please, I beg of you, don't 
Don't take my wife and my kids. Don't sell them into slavery. I will, I will do my best. I will pay you back the best I can. And the king looks down and he says, he had mercy. He had grace. And he says, you know, your debts are forgiven. Don't worry about it. Just go. And what does that person do? He goes, oh, whoo. And then he sees a guy who owes him a hundred bucks. Walks up to him and says, hey, give me a hundred bucks. Give me my money. And he looks at him and says, I don't have it right now, man. Can I, can you give me like a couple weeks so I can, you know, get paid and then I'll give you a hundred bucks? And he grabs him by the throat and says, no, you need to pay me now. Jailer, come get him. Has he demonstrated mercy and grace that he was offered by the king? No. True repentance would understand what he's been granted by the king. You see, God's wrath, we face God's wrath because of our sin, but Jesus took that on himself, and therefore, we don't have to face that wrath. And we are to, the fruit of repentance is the idea we're supposed to treat others with the same manner that we've been treated by God. And so when we think of that, it's the idea that repentance helps us to, to step to, our first step is living in the grace of God that has appeared to us in our speech, in our conduct, in our allegiance, in our purity, in, in all of our life, in our faith, in our love, so that when we see others who owe us, we do the same thing that God did to us. That's the fruit of repentance. That's the, the fruit of turning from uh, my way to God's way, to understand God's grace, His unmerited favor. Not one person in this room, in this world, deserves God's grace. Yet God bestows it upon us like you can't even fathom. Dumps it on us. Bucket after bucket after bucket after bucket. And so when you think about the, the, the transformation of the gospel in your life, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, do I demonstrate the fruit of repentance in my life? Do I demonstrate my eagerness to live in a way that is honoring to that grace that has been given to me? Does my thoughts, do my actions, do my words, do my emotions, all of them seek to honor God instead of myself? You, you know that. You know what's in your heart. You have to, you have to, to, to kind of judge yourself on that. Let God's word penetrate. And so as, as we go back to Luke chapter 3, the, the, this next thing that we see is if we're, if we're truly producing the fruit of repentance, the next fruit is the fruit of faith. The fruit of trusting God, not ourselves. So these people ask, what should we do then? All right, tax collectors, what should we do? He says, don't collect more than you require. Soldiers, what should we do? Don't extort. Just be content with where you are. This idea of trusting God to provide, trusting God to take care of your needs, trusting God to, to be there with you through thick and thin. Romans chapter 1, Paul gives us kind of his opening statement to the gospel, to the, to the book of Romans. And, and he says... For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous, or the just, shall live by what? Faith. The just shall live by faith. So if we've been made right with God, then we live a life that is by faith, not by what I can do, what I can accomplish. Look at me. I can keep all the rules, all 623 Levitical laws. Anybody here can do that? I doubt it. I mean, come on now. I like baking too much. So I'm already automatically just, you know, swipe that one off me. I like baking. I can't keep the Levitical law. I like to wear polyester. I like to wear, you know, different materials that are woven together. Oh, can't do that one. All right. But the reality is none of us can do that. And so by faith, we trust God who made us right to keep us right as we live in this world. The just shall live by faith. We have been justified by Christ. We stand right in God's eyes, not on our merit, but on the merit of Christ who died on the cross, was buried and rose victoriously to pay for our sins. That's why when he said, to tell us die, it is finished, payment is paid, you are made just in that moment. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the what? The righteousness of God. You see, in our coming to repent, we are placing our faith in God and His ability, not our ability, to change us and make us more like Him. It's about what He can do in us. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. We quote this all the time. 
You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and what? He shall direct thy paths. Look at the next couple of verses after 5 and 6. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. We all the 5 and 6. Oh, yeah, that's right. But then what does he go follow it up? Do not be wise in your own eyes. Humble yourself before the Lord. He'll bring health to you. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth, with your first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. See, trust means we're going to trust God with our lives, with our being, with our possessions, so that we live for him, we give him everything we have, because we know he's going to take care of us. That's what it means, the just shall live by faith. By faith, we trust God to give us what we need every day for that day. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 and verse 6 talk about what faith is. Simple, simple yet very powerful definition. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we did not, do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Verse 6, I love this verse. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and that what? He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. He rewards us who earnestly I mean, that's what faith is. Faith is confidence. I bet you there were a lot of people this spring had confidence in the Boston Bruins that they were going to win the Stanley Cup. Yeehaw! Yeah, they were the best team in the league. They had the greatest record. And what did they do? They blew a 3-1 lead and lost to the Florida Panthers. Who would have seen that coming? I did. It always seems to happen when someone great like that happens. You get too proud or you're full of yourself. That's what happens in our lives. When we start to think about ourselves, we become full of ourselves. And what we've done, God could take us down an notch or two or three or four or five. God, who knows? He could flatten us. He could let us fall flat on our face. You see, faith is this idea of trusting Him. It's the idea of seeking to please God with my thoughts, with my words, with my actions, with my life, the way that I love my community. I mean, think about John's request, answer to the question, what shall we do then? If you have two shirts, give one away. All right? Don't extort more money for yourselves. Don't extort from the people. Don't try and create more wealth. Be content. He's telling them that as a Christian, we are to be content with what we have so that we can help other people. The question for us is, is our faith leading us to be involved in serving others? Do we see needs around us and want to help? Now, I'm not saying we can't, we can't help everybody. But there are people we can help. And, and if we pray, God will open that door. God will lead us to those people that need help. Whether it's uh, sitting down and, and just having tea with someone because they need company, that's helping, that's serving. Whether it's mowing their lawn, whether it's you know picking up a uh, newspaper, bringing it to the door, you know, whatever it might be, there's tons of ways, but that's faith in action. You see, receiving grace and unmerited, unmerited favor from God builds in us a trust that we know God is God. And his love is that which holds us, it helps us, it leads us in whatever circumstances we go through. That's why Paul writes, I am content in whatever circumstance I am. I am content in whatever circumstance. Good, bad, and I took Paul went through some great circumstances in his life. And some really bad ones. Have you ever been shipwrecked? Almost. Almost. All right. Uh, you ever been whipped 39 times minus 4 or 5 times? Nope, never been whipped. Go all, does a willow switch count? All right. That was different. I got punishment for that one. All right. So, you know, think about all these things. Even, anybody been in prison? You've been in prison wrongly. Yet he was content in every situation. Why? Because in his heart he had God. You see, when we go through life and we have God on our side and we live by faith, no matter what comes our way, no matter if we get cancer, no matter if we have a heart attack, no matter if we face whatever death certainty, we don't have to fear anything because who's on our side? We trust in God to take care of us. We trust in God to lead us. We trust in God to help us. James chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy, 
when you fall into what? Various kinds of good times? Is that what it says? No, when you fall into various trials and tribulations, because why? They produce, they, they, they are there to produce what? A stronger faith. Second Peter chapter 1. To think about this in the face of, uh, of everything we face, that, that our faith is in God. It says His divine power, the power that rose Christ from the dead, His divine power that is, is, is for us, all right, said, it has given us what? Everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, because God has given us His promises, because He's given us everything that He is, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. To your goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, mutual affection, to mutual affection, love. Wait a minute. What is he saying here? We're to add to our faith these things. Guess what he's saying to add to it? Point number three. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, which is testifying. You see, the, the, the fruit of repentance is turning, the fruit of faith is trusting, and the fruit of the Spirit is testifying to what God has done in your life. That's gospel transformation. Is there not coming to the place where you're, you're willing and excited to tell others about what God has done in you and through you and why He's done this? Because we're to make every effort to add to our faith these things. See, the testimony of faith of the Spirit is what the Spirit produces in us. And we go to Galatians chapter 5 to read that list. And in Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes to the church of Galatia, he's talking about freedom in Christ, the beginning of the chapter, and life by the Spirit. And so verse 16, he says, say, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Here's it, the acts of the flesh, the evil part. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit, singular here, the fruit, singular fruit here. It's not multiple fruits, it's a one fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is this, love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. So here he says the fruit of the Spirit is all those things that you're supposed to be adding to your faith. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, gentleness. These are the things you're supposed to add to your faith anyway, and it's a product of, the, of living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. You know that if you say, I'm working on my love, but you have no joy, you are not working on your love. Say you have love, but you have no joy. You can't be working on joy because they all flow together. You can't have one without the other. That's why it's a singular. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit. You see, when we come to Christ, when we let the gospel, the good news of Christ, transform us, when we re truly repent and turn from our ways to following God's ways and put our trust fully in Him, the fruit of our life will be that, testifying to the work of the Spirit on how we love, the joy we have, the peace we have, the perseverance that we have, the self-control, the gentleness, all of that list is one fruit that is produced in us by the power of God. It is the expectation of one who walks by the Spirit. It is the expectation of one who has been transformed by the Gospel. It is the expectation of every follower of Christ. This is how you know they are, they are my disciples. By what? Their love for one another. The only way you love others is by the fruit of the Spirit that is testifying through you that you can love everyone in this room no matter what they say or do. Or how they offend you. Or how they are still immature in their faith. Because God transforms us to see them as He sees them. 
to love them as He loves them, to have joy with them as He rejoices with them. Maybe you're here today and you need to repent and turn to Christ. And in that repentance, you need to receive by faith His gift. I mean, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. That's why we don't have to fear death, because we have eternal life. I don't have to worry about tomorrow because God's got it. If I die today, guess what? I'm with Him forever and ever. Therefore, I don't have to fear death. See, maybe you're here today and you need that, or you fear that, or you know how you've misunderstood, you, know, you haven't truly turned or repented of your sins and put your full trust and faith in what Christ has done on the cross. Maybe you have put your faith in Christ. Maybe you are a follower of Christ. You've been, you got saved years ago and you haven't fully been encouraged. You haven't found a place where you can be encouraged to walk in a way that is growing and making every effort to produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Guess what 1 John 1, 9 says? Confess your sins to the Lord and He will forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Same word. It's the same thing. Repent. Turn to God. And when you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, as God is approaching the idea of the church, He's talking to these churches. He says, you have this good thing, but I have this one thing against you. And every one of them, what's the, what's the recourse? What's the product that will bring them back into right standing? It's repentance. It's repentance. Far too often in our church, we water down the gospel to say believe, but the reality is you believe because you understand your position and you repent of that. You turn to Christ and you give everything of your life to Him. It's one thing to know the gospel. It's, one, it's another thing to live the gospel. They call it the 18-inch 18 18 inch difference. We can know about Christ and all He's done here, but if you've never, ever let it take root in your heart, in your life, as we celebrate communion here in just a brief moment, this is bread, this is juice, all right? It's a cup, it's, it's, it's stale bread, all right? I'll give you that. It's not very tasty, but it's a reminder of what? The gospel. It's a reminder of that cross that our Savior bled and died on, that He gave His life to pay the penalty that you and I owed. So that we can live freely from sin. Not to our pleasure. But to his glory forever and ever. That's what we need to be reminded of. The invitation is clear. It's a call to repent and by faith let Christ transform your life. Whether you are not a believer or whether you are a believer. The call is for all of us the same. Let us be transformed by that grace which has appeared to us in Jesus Christ. John's message they, the, the end of there, at the end of the message in John, in Luke chapter 3, was what? Are you the Messiah? And he said, no, 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 I'm not the Messiah. I can't even untie his sandal. One that's coming after me will be greater, and he will give you what? Not just water. He'll just baptize you water. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the guarantor of our salvation. He's the one that produces the fruit of us. He's the gardener in our life. And next week, we're going to learn about this idea of how do we how do we cultivate a deeper relationship with God? Well, Jesus tells us in John 15, the idea of the abiding principle. See, as we, as we allow the gospel to transform us, we will want it more and more. And so this morning, the invitation is clear to all of us. Are you producing, or is the gospel producing, fruit of transformation? It starts in repentance, turns to faith. And is lived out by walking by the Spirit, testifying to what God has done in you. See, every one of us, if we've come to Christ, we should be telling us our life should be a living testimony to the effect of the gospel. That others see us. This past week when I went on the Freedom Tour, I never once told anybody I was a pastor. The kids knew it. But people began asking conversations, and I told them what I do, that I was a pastor of a church, and it opened up conversation to share with them about Christ and the goodness and the need for Christ in our life. We don't have to, you mean, sometimes you need to tell others, you can come out in front of but other times if you're just going down and conversation starts, you should know how to testify to what God has done in your life. That's the eagerness of repentance. And so I challenge all of us today, are we living a life that is being transformed by that which we've been given in Christ? 
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you show us the idea of uh, we need to be producing the fruit of repentance in our life by what we say, how we live, what we do. Are we committed to Christ over everything else in our life? Is God first? Oh, Father God, forgive us for those times when you're not. Forgive me when I lack self-control. Forgive me when I lack perseverance. Forgive me when I lack the fruit that is produced by walking in the Spirit, when I try and walk in my own abilities and powers. Oh, Lord God, I just want to, I want us to be a people, Lord, that seeks to please you, that seeks to honor you. And we have to do that by faith, trusting in you and your work. Yes, Lord, the gospel does save us, but the gospel also sanctifies us every day, and we need to preach that to ourselves. And rejoice in that favor that you've given us, that unmerited favor that you gave us in Christ. That we may know the breadth and the depth and the width and the height and the love of, the love of God. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much now. In your name we pray. Amen. Did Samuel sing the wondrous Here we practice an open communion, so if you are a believer and you would like...
would like to join, we invite you to join. If you do not have a communion cup, there are some on our tables. We can have those brought to you. Um, but we would do invite you to take in this uh, very uh, opportunity to praise our Savior. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes specifically to the church about communion, about the Lord's Supper. And he goes on and he writes, For I received from the Lord, in verse 23 of chapter 11, I also pass unto you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as we celebrate communion, we are proclaiming what Christ has done on our behalf. We are, we are putting our faith in that very act of the cross, that very act of dying in our place. And remembering that this is just a piece of bread, but it's a reminder of the body that was broken for our sin. Drinking the cup, the blood that was spilt for the remission of our sins. To understand the grace that has appeared to us. That brought salvation. And so let us take a moment to examine our own hearts, to pray and ask God to bless this as we partake this morning. Father, we all sit here or stand here this morning in awe of what you've done for us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the life that you lived, the life that you gave, the life that died, the life that was raised victoriously defeating sin and death. We thank you for the body that you gave willingly to be broken on our behalf, the blood that was spilt to cover our sins, to pay the payment which we could not pay. Oh, Father God, we confess the fact that we have a daily need for you to help us to live in a manner that will glorify you in our To think about the fruit that we produce, does it keep in line with that which we've been granted in Christ? Oh, Father God, we thank you, we praise you, we give you the glory now. In your name we pray. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And he broke it and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup. And he lifted it up and he blessed it. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And as is our custom, we celebrate that. It says that they left there and they sang a hymn. And so if you're visiting with us, we invite you to join us because we, uh, we like to sing in, as a family. So we get up and we form a great big circle and sing, Blessed Be the Tie. So just everyone kind of come on in and join us and we sing together.
Amen. Amen. If you're visiting with us, we hope you stay for coffee and snacks afterwards. We're glad